last time I was like, where is everybody? But then everyone showed up slightly late. That was weird. But today, I suspect that Kalinia might have, everybody's asleep or working. So we had a lot of not submits. So, um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. So, hello, thanks for being here. Um, so, new feature on the website. Um, as you may notice, this, uh, there's two new things. One is we're putting up the look lecture slides, the things you do in here right there. And then we've also added a link. Um, I have. It's noisy out there. We're not clicked yet. Um, so there's also a link here where if you click this, it'll list all the things that are especially most important. Um, and I'm also going to put a summary of the things that seem most important from that day's lecture. And then I'll also send out a very short survey after class today. If you're kind of surveyed out, then wait until we do another one. But if you want to give any feedback now, this will be a way for you to drop some thoughts anonymously. Okay. So that's administration stuff. Um, so Laser's good. Yeah. Oh, you know what it is. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. So let's start with a problem. This is again the like, how you guys feeling about everything? So, um, as usual, we'll just start to do a couple of these things. Okay. 
guys are cleverly using one that we just said. <laughs> No, no. The one answer that's very popular is probably the one you're
um, natural examples of places where you might want the order. Yeah. Twenty-nine rankings. All right. Okay. A dictionary might actually be a good example of that, right? You might sometimes want to look at um, the most alphabetical words starting with B or something like that. Select. Who remembers what select does? Right. Do you have an answer? Yeah. It returns the value of the key. Okay, well, that's kind of the get function. A select is the opposite of the rank function. What does the rank function do? So, select and rank are functions to get you know, either the k element or um, the rank function tells you what is the order of an element in the ordered list. Does that make sense? So if I give you a key of, um, say, B, you look it up in your order symbol table, and you tell me that's the third element according to the order. So that, in our model, it looks like it has some keys, but there are no values associated with those keys. So how would you do it with an associative array? What you could do is just have some kind of dummy token value for every possible value. So whenever the key comes into it, it would be, uh, you would insert that key together with the same dummy value. They basically ignore the whole value concept. The keys are all you care about. It's like a bag, but you only have one copy. Yeah, it's similar to a bag API. Yeah, you can only have one of each thing. What about a simple table that allows to look up by key or by value? That's an easy one. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. Does that make sense to everyone? You can't do it with a single symbol table, but if you just had two of them, every time you get a print method, by key and value, you call the put method on the first one, and on the second one, you call the put method by value and then by key. Yep. Like, why? Like, but it's not necessarily invertible, though. Like, even if you allow only one value per key, like, you have multiple keys. Uh huh. Kind of right. Same. So, you, you would have to change uh, the definition of the API of what that means. That's a good point, though. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I'm going to shoot. Okay. Yeah, good point. Otherwise, we can't fully do it. So, there's sort of a trick question with our intention. It's, it's not yeah. possible to do full length, but if you're willing to take that constraint, you're good. Okay, next. Uh, okay, this is a fun one. So, that's a great question. So the first question 
it's a little dry, but you're going to need it for the gate puzzle, the next assignment. And it's not too bad. It's just like a set of things you have to do. Sure. Okay. Well, did anybody happen to look it up? Is anybody in that bowl? No? Alright, so I'll just go through it because I just want to make sure that everyone thinks about it. And the second part's a little more interesting. So, um, things you have to do, let's see. Um, so, first you have to check that the check that the two things being compared are not the same object, are not the same exact uh, reference. Check that the two objects are the same class. Um, you have to Pass from object to the appropriate class, then you have to turn false if the instance variables do not match. Okay, so you know this is in the this is not that exciting, but it's a thing you'll have to know. And we get a feeling for it. a puzzle. I just want everybody to see it at least once. The more interesting question is: when you're building a symbol table, when would you want to use equals, and when would you want to use compare to? Yep. Yeah. Uh, you want to use. What was your reasoning though? Otherwise, we'd have to have some pretty messy code to check for our nulls there. 
What about null values? This one's easier. Yeah? Um, otherwise, you're just uh, wasting space. Okay. Other answers? If you iterated through the entire simple table, you'd have null values. So something like that. Um, okay, so why, why would that be a problem, though? You could check a key and if <laughs> Other answers? <laughs> I don't know, but your application. Okay. Yep. And it's like for the points, it communicates like outputting a null with like a or something. That was pretty similar to our answer. So so what, what do we return from a get method when the key was not found? Null. But if you want a null value, the client would have no way of distinguishing when you're returning a null because the value was actually null versus when you're returning a null because the key was not found. Here's another question. If we did a lot of null values, what would we have to do in the get method when the key was not found? I think I heard the right answer. Can you speak up? Yeah, you'd have to throw an exception uh, in order to tell the client that something went wrong and the key was not found here. So you could do that. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's just a lot simpler to do it this way. Okay, bonus question. So what if you pretty much had the answer to this in response to one of the previous questions? So just say that again. Anybody? Yeah. Okay, um, and how would that ordered symbol table keep track of the popular words? Okay, so if you already have um, a symbol table, that keeps track of the frequencies of all the words that you've seen so far, then you can call the, uh, what is it, the select function n times. How, what, what would you have to do, though, in the get method, or in the put method, or whatever, to make sure that when you get a new, when you get a new word, you're able to update the symbol table so that it keeps track of the frequency counts of all the words? Uh-huh, right, so you would first um, check if the key is in there. If it's not in there, you would insert it with a value of 1. If it's already in there, you would do a get. You would look at the value, increment it by 1, and then put it back in. What about an extra bonus question? Can you do it in a space? Well, what's the space for this? If, you, if you're getting n words here, and you're only asked for the m popular words, the symbol table data structure would require a space proportional to n, right? What about, can you do it in proportional to m space? Priority queue. Priority queue, go on, how would that work? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who thinks the answer is yes, who thinks the answer is no? Uh, yes, okay, I'm hearing some yeses. Am I hearing any no's? We should ask them <laughs> Yeah, yep. You think it's no, why is it no? That's, that's a pretty good explanation. Here's, here's, how, here's how I would put it. Let's say there are capital N possible words, right? Big N, not, not M. You have to remember for each of those N words how many times you've seen them so far. It's not enough to remember the popular words up until this point. Why? Because the least popular guy could suddenly get a wave of support and then climb up all the way to the top, and there's no way you can produce the correct answer in response to that kind of situation unless you've been tracking everybody's popularity all along. And so that's why you need space, space proportional to n. And then more broadly, you know, we picked this because it has that texture of priority queue. Yeah. And it seems like, okay, yeah, yeah, that's the kind of thing you do with priority queue. But if you give it a little more thought, you realize... You were hoping somebody would say priority queue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, then you're right. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's about the space more than, yeah. All right. So that's our big picture recap kind of questions. <coughs> What's next? Oh, I see we got our... Okay. Yeah. All right.
All right, so um, here's the thing I want to tell you guys. Uh, this is about how associative arrays are treated in various programming languages. And the context for this is, when I think about what, I, what data structures I use when I program, like associative arrays, I use that term instead of symbol tables, but they're really the same thing. I use it far more than any other data structure, like by far. Um, it's probably like 20 times more often than I would ever use a stack. I think I've used the task stack maybe three times in my life, and two of them were when solving the first assignment. I'm not kidding. But, uh, <laughs> but this one is really, really very useful. Like, it was kind of funny for me to see the applications of symbol table slide, because to me, everything is an application of a symbol table. It's really the first thing that comes to mind. If you can't do it with an associative array, then you start thinking about other things. So, um, many programming languages you know, treat it as a very, very key part, and some of them call them by different names, dictionary map, Python calls it a dictionary. Java, actually, also has it as part of the standard library. It's called the map interface. So a map interface, interfaces, as you recall, correspond to these abstract data types or APIs, right? So that's the abstract interface, and it has a whole bunch of different implementations. Um, which one of these do you think might correspond to something very similar to what we've seen today? Tree map, that's right. Yep, that's what I put first. There are a whole bunch of other cool things, um, like concurrent. What, what is this word concurrent? Does anyone know what, what that is? What's that? <laughs> All right, but what does it mean in programming languages? So concurrent data structures are used when you have different threads, which is different programs operating at the same time on the same data structure, which is something we will totally not see in this class. It's kind of a path to insanity, but it's used a lot in, uh, in many large, complex programming systems. Um, and I think if you, can, if you can do threads and you come out alive, they'll make you a professor or something. <laughs> but what we're going to see in, in the next class is going to be hash map, hash table, those kind of implementations. And it's super cool. Yeah. So that's Java. What about some other programming languages? In Python and Perl and many other languages, it's, it's like totally baked into the language. You don't even need us to call some kind of special data structure for it. Um, it's as fundamental as arrays. Here's, here's what happens in Python. You can declare a symbol table or a search of array and define it and give it values just by calling it like this. When, just like you use square brackets for arrays, you can use these curly brackets for symbol table. So foo is the key here and bar is the value. So what's going on here? This is a string, but this other key is an integer. Right? In Java, this kind of thing would probably be a problem, but Python doesn't care. Like the honey badger, Python, <laughs> <laughs> Python is another animal that just doesn't give a shit. And, and so you can just stuff anything you want. Some of you didn't get that. Um, you too. Very much recommended. Um, so you can just stuff whatever you want into an associative array. And this is very, very convenient when you're programming. It's like that dude who has a very cluttered desk but always remembers where everything went. And you know, if you're kind of the more organized and erotic type, you'd be like, ah, oh, all these things are of different types and you're putting them all together. Um, but he doesn't care, he knows where everything is. So Python's kind of like that, it differs from Java. And um, accessing an associative array element is just as simple as accessing an actual array element. So based on this, can you predict how you insert a new value? Let's say I want to insert the, value, uh, the key key and give it the value value. How would I do it? Right, a of key equals value, so that's how simple it is. Uh, in Python and a lot of other languages. Now, some other languages go like completely crazy with associative arrays. In fact, there's, oh, I was supposed to unroll the next step, but you already had the answer. Uh, anyway. So PHP, it doesn't even have arrays. It only has associative arrays. So all arrays, even if you just want the consecutive you know, integer indexes, it's in, in, impl implemented internally in terms of associative arrays. Um, where's PHP used? Who uses it? Right, it's used a lot in web development where people optimize for convenience more than error checking or some other uh, things like that. Now there's one more language in which all objects are simply associative arrays. Objects internally, they're nothing more than associative arrays. So what that means is if you do object.var equals value or something like that, all that's going on is it gets translated internally to objects being an associative array, val being a key, uh, and then you set it to some value. Do you, 
GS, have you guys seen this? Can you guess what language this might be? It's also very popular in web development. JavaScript, yes. Which might in fact be the most popular language ever, simply because it runs on every web page. Um, so this is what happens if when you use object.var, internally it's merely object.var. So JavaScript is a very funny language. It was um, invented by Netscape when they were in a browser war with Microsoft back in, back in the mid-90s. And so they implemented this over a period of a couple of months, and then it, it was called LiveScript when they were building it. Just before they released it, they changed the name to JavaScript. Do you know why? Because Java was very popular at the time, and they thought that by hijacking the name, they could get some of that popularity. So because of that, developers have just hated, hated the name for uh, since then, because you know, as far as the language is concerned, JavaScript has nothing at all to do with Java. And I suspect that um, the dude who was developing the JavaScript, his name is Brendan Eich, now he works for Mozilla. I think he just implemented this feature in, a, in an afternoon so that just so that he could say, hey, JavaScript is object-oriented. <laughs> That's my guess. Um, so just a couple more quick things I want to say about this. So associated arrays are very similar to functions. There is a natural correspondence between them. When you call f of xyz, that's very similar to having an associative array that has all the function input-output pairs, so that a function call with xyz would roughly correspond to a get method on the associative array, where you give it xyz sort of all together an array as argument, right? And so this is a powerful paradigm. Because you can use lookup tables, or symbol tables, associative arrays, whatever you want to call them, in order to implement functions. And there are some functions that are actually implemented this way on your computer. Can you guess what some of those might be? Inverse trigonometric functions. That's a very good guess. That is true. But in fact, actual normal trigonometric functions are also implemented simply as giant lookup tables. It turns out it's faster to look up the value of a sign from a table that's pre-stored on your computer instead of calculating it every time. Um, and you know, a real-world analogy is law. Has anyone looked at law tables ever? A physical printed ones you have? Okay, cool. I thought it was just me. Um, because, you know, they used to be very popular, right? I've been in this house, it's just locked in. It's like, oh, wow, this is weird. It's like a dystopian nightmare. Um, so I was, uh, I was looking at this, um, I was looking up a section of arrays on Wikipedia to see if there were any cool facts, and there was one that I, that I found very interesting. I, I have no idea if this is actually true, but this is what Wikipedia claims. Uh, that the oldest lookup table, apparently, was the sign function. This was by the mathematician Ari with or something like that in 5th century AD, and apparently the values of sine functions are encoded into this Sanskrit um, verse. I don't know if that's actually true, but that's what it claims. Can anybody read that? Okay. So here's, here's one more cool thing. Associative arrays are used a lot in chess, and it's actually, it's, it's led to a mini revolution in chess playing. Let me tell you why. It turns out, in chess, you know, when you have an evaluation function to compute how good a position is, once you get down to a certain number of pieces, you can enumerate all of those possible positions and store them in a massive lookup table. And that lets you do some very cool things. So, oh, does anyone play chess? Can you tell me who might, who might be winning in this situation? Okay. Black is probably winning. If you play chess, then, you know, that should be, that, that would be a good guess. But it's, it's actually really hard to tell if this position is won for black or if it's a draw. Here's the magic of lookup tables. A computer calculated that black wins in exactly 154 moves. Not in 153 moves, 154 moves. And if you've heard about exponential complexity and how hard it is to calculate future moves in chess, this might be shocking to you. But this is what you cannot do simply with functions, but you can do uh, if you're able to put a lookup table structure on top of it. I'll let you think about that and see how that might happen. You get very little taste of it in the, uh, in the eight puzzle assignment that involves the A-star algorithm. But chess is where this principle uh, really shines, and you can do a lot of cool things. All right. All right. So you guys are super jazzed about simple tables now. Let's talk about how we do them. Um, I want to give a different picture about like this board. So um, one of the possible ways you can implement a simple table is, uh, as, as mentioned in the online lectures or in the book, is you can keep uh, an ordered list where we have a linked list, and if we want to find something, um, we just step through the list, and we get there eventually. And so even though everything here is in order. We can't get to the thing we want because it takes a long time to get there. Um, so we have to follow all these links. So one solution, which we won't talk about here, is the so-called stick list. 
or you add express lanes and you can bypass if you need to. Um, so this is actually a fairly popular, some, some popular uh, thing in practice, but it's non-standard. And the strange thing is that these express lanes are probabilistic. And this is a whole big field. And the guy who made this, by the way, is the same guy who wrote fine bugs, which I think is neat. Um, so um, that's a skip list, but we're not going to talk about it. Instead, what we're going to do is think about how we can change a linked list to be more efficient. So one thing we could do is stick our pointer in the middle. So that would be cool, because then um, it gives us maybe this side a bit too faster. Um, but what's the problem here? These guys are lost. So what could we do, maybe? Well, I wouldn't necessarily doubly link. I guess we could. I'm going to be minimalist with my links and just flip these, right? So at this point, I have a linked list that now is half, as, uh, it does everything twice as fast. Now, is that actually useful in practice for a giant linked list? No. Why? Still linear. So we want to dream big here. We don't want to just stop with this. What we can do at this link is we can make all the links do big jumps. So in this case, uh, if we want to follow the binary search tree, where do you think this link's going to go? I heard a murmur of B, maybe? And a D. What we could do is make a big jump here. And now we run into that same problem we did before, where some of the elements are inaccessible. So what do we want to do here? Flip that link. OK, we do that. And we can repeat this process uh, in general with the linked list. And we'll eventually arrive at a shape something like this, uh, which is just a binary search tree in disguise. So that's all a binary search tree is. Just a linked list where you do this process. It was ordered in the first place. Now, this isn't a good way to necessarily, this isn't a good way to build the binary search tree because you have to go through and build this giant linked list. And so our goal is going to be concerned with building something that approximates this structure as practically as possible. And that's the topic of the rest of today and all of next lecture. All right? So what's nice about this is now we can get places a lot faster. In fact, we have the, the process of finding things and inserting things is related to the height. So if we have a so in the worst case, if our height as h, we're going to have to do, say, three compares here. Our height is 2 um, in order to get where we want. Um, and our practical overall, what we're going to do is we're going to have disordered data. We're not going to get everything fed to us in order to be able to have linked lists to start with. So we're going to try and figure out how to do put and delete efficiently. Okay? So let me give you a picture of um, how the process works. And you guys have seen this with Bob, but I just want to go over it again. So the best we can possibly do is logarithmic if our tree is really nice. And if my, where's my mouse first? There you are. Okay, so as you guys remember, the, the side to side motion is accommodating the uh, additional links. Um, and so you can see the, the nice thing here is that this tree, it's just the first order. I'm just thinking that I'm inserting the way that you guys did when we started the lecture today, that you guys are mostly familiar with. And you see that overall it does pretty good. Um, you know, there's a few long branches, but on average, we see that we're not too far from the optimal if everything was perfectly balanced. So that's nice. Um, so you can ask questions about just how hard and how big will this tree get in general. Um, so here, um, it, there's this neat uh, finding that if you take totally random elements and you use the default simple insert, then you end up with a tree which is around 4.311 natural log n. Um, and that's good, fine, or whatever. But the problem is that even if you're, there's still a chance that you're going to hit this worst case of n. In fact, there's pathological. So a quick sort. We said, hey, what if we, how do we avoid hitting our worst case with quick start? What do we do? We shuffle. But with the binary search tree, why don't we shuffle? Um, well, because stuff's coming at us, like randomly, right? Someone's calling put. So we can't say, nope, don't give me that data. I want you, client, you're only going to give me data in random order now. You can't command the client. So he's going to feed us stuff when he wants. So we have to worry about this case. Um, so if we can, um, Another result we can have, so this is right here the worst case. This is going to be the, we have a model for input data. Um, one nice thing you can say is that if we do happen to get stuff in a random order, um, that the expected number of compares to do any particular search or insert. So this is the, the, this is the worst case on average. This is just the, um, the average case. So if we feed a bunch of random data, there's a neat fact that overall the number of compares we have to do is two natural log n. Um, and the reason for that is that this whole thing ends up being exactly like quicksort, for reasons I kind of alluded to a second ago. So the idea is that I'm getting data coming in randomly. So if someone gives me P first, it's sort of like whenever this is the data I'm being fed, I don't know if the client's going to send me, 
But whenever I pivot that first P, I'm effectively pivoting on P with the data I have yet to see. So it's a little weird. It's like a non-causal quicksort. Um, but um, so P though will effectively end up in the middle, and you'll see that the recursive structure of how quicksort partitions the data that it has all of it at the beginning is just what you get if you follow the VSD process. Um, so that gives us a feeling for the average case. So what we're going to talk about is dealing with um, uh, in, for this lecture and in the future is how to, so we're doing pretty good with insert, we're going to have to talk about delete, and then next time we'll talk about doing bigger and more balanced trees. Um, so we're going to go through the code in a second, but I just want to, before we do that, uh, point out that if we compare this original uh, structure we had before, this is the linked list in order versus this new nicer thing, um, in the worst case, we're exactly where we were. Because one of the, the worst cases, you guys remember from the first slide, is that tree that's uh, in a line, that everything's in order. So we still have that, that worst case in time web. But if we're just feeding random data, because of that uh, parallel of quicksort, we'll probably end up being logarithmic. OK. And in the next lecture that I've alluded to a couple times, we'll do something where we can always have that. We have not talked about the OK. So we're going to try something a little dangerous and do some live coding. Um, but it will be in you know, so we'll see how it goes. Um, so Fortunately, we don't have to compile them. Yeah, we don't compile them. Okay, so one thing that I think doesn't necessarily come across super well um, without doing it is how this code looks exactly. You want to implement these operations that you guys have some feeling for. So my suggested exercise, sometime before the bit term, this isn't urgent. Um, this very simple uh, BSD, API, I would recommend that you guys try to implement this just to get a feeling for how the recursive code looks. And you can compare against our official rep, uh, on, the, on the book side. Um, so we're going to do these two together today, get the put, and try the delete methods. They're tricky on your own. And then in assignment five, um, you'll get a lot of feeling for this stuff. You, will not see, you won't get to do any deleting. So if you ever want to write delete code for a recursive tree structure, this is your chance. Um, so let's start. Let's talk about what these methods will look like. Okay. Danger. Let's see how it goes. Okay. Oh, window. Okay. Um, so, um, let's start by talking about the get method. What will it look like? Okay, so our tree, um, hopefully, so people in the back, I know this may, can you read this at all? Okay. Yeah, all right. Good. So, um, whenever we have a get method, I'm going to change this up. It's always terrifying to line code. So, I have the answer right next to it when I wrote earlier. Okay. So, um, when we write our get method, our ultimate goal is when we return the value corresponding to the current key. So, this very common practice that you'll see over and over again when you're doing these recursive structures is we want to make something else. What do you guys think? Some kind of special way. Uh, well, yeah, case, but I want a little helper method. So that's going to be my first thing I want to do here. So um, the idea is that this helper method is going to walk through our tree. Um, that some trouble. Okay, so the idea is yeah. And whenever git happens, all it's going to do is we're going to pass the block over to our helper method, and we're going to say, okay, I want to get um, the key start. Where are we going to start looking? Root. Okay, so that's how our method begins, and we're going to do it. Okay, now is where we have to start thinking about when we're crawling through this tree. So the first thing we're going to do, not really, but while we're thinking, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do the comparison. We're going to say, um, how does the current, how does the key that we're looking for compare to the current key, right? So this is that step we're trying to decide which way to go. Um, if compare is equal to zero, what happens then? Yeah, we're going to return the value. Okay, good. And if compare is less, then what do we do? Okay, get x left key. Um, that's not quite what we want, though, right? So after we get it, what do we need to do? So get's going to return something. So what do we want to do? What do you guys think? It would just return that. So it's very concise, and you can just say, okay, well, Whatever, I can't help. I, I don't know. I don't know what the thing is, but that guy will. So whatever he says, I'm going to say it back to you. Um, OK. Um, and then just bigger, then pattern matching you guys know will be, I said, right, key. OK, so we're not quite done, though. So what's the issue so far? 
There's one thing wrong. So we can fall off our tree, right? So we had a case where we might get to the point where x left is null. So if it's null, what do we want to do? We want to return something. Null. So the idea here is we fall off the tree and there's no information here. Um, and if this code runs and the key is not at the table, what's going to ultimately happen? It will be null. So null is going to be the value of times back up. Now, in retrospect, I realized it would be nice to have a picture that goes with this, but I don't. Uh, but so this is what the git method will look like. And this is a very common pattern. So I just want you guys, you guys to see the thought process that goes into developing this recursive method. Here's, here's, uh, here's one observation about this recursive method, but also pretty much every recursive method that you're going to see on trees is what's going on initially is you make a recursive call, right? And then that recursive call makes another recursive call. And each time, it's passing the, the key down the tree, right? You start with the key on top, and then that guy tells the guy below it, hey, here's the key, and you go all the way down to the bottom or wherever you need it to go, and then you fetch the value there, and everybody tells the guy above him or her whatever, what the value is, and it comes back to the top. So you have a value kind of um, slowly going down and some other value gradually coming up. So that's going to be the structure of any of these recursive calls. All right. So. Um Again, since we're experimental, it's hard to say what the timing is going to be like. So we were originally thinking we would make you write a flip method based on this. Um, but I think that I don't, I'm not convinced it will be the best use of our time the other day. So I want to point out, um, if we look at what the flip method does, I just want to point out one really interesting pattern. And I encourage you guys to try this out. I mean, again, you will see this when you get to KD tree. So when you get to KD tree and you're like, ah, I'm so confused, my life's terrible. Go back to this slide. And the common pattern is that whenever you're changing something up in the tree, that, um, so whenever we're flipping, this is the kind of uh, surprising line here, that whenever you're trying to put something in place, of course, you're trying to find where it would go. And if that spot's empty, then you're going to fill it in. And so there's this process where each, um, each call to put is going to be passing back a node. So instead of this being a type void, it's a type node. So if, if anything, I think that's going to be the, the somewhat mysterious take home message that you're always passing references around. And the fundamental thing you're trying to address is um, whenever you insert a node at the bottom, right, the thing you have to do is make sure the parent knows how to connect to that child. And the way we do that is by having each child pass up a reference to itself. When I'm done with my put job, I tell the boss uh, where I came from. So I know that's a little hazy now because you don't have time to really ruminate. But that will be something very important when you get to KD3. Um, also, one thing I wanted to mention is that collinear is traditionally one of the hardest assignments in the class. So don't feel like you're uh, facing down the most terrible meat grinder of the class. It'll get nicer. Um, OK. So um, one more thing, I guess. We'll switch back to full screen mode here. Um, OK. So what I will encourage is that the delete methods, we'll talk about the function of delete in a little bit. But uh, getting it right, implementing this is really tough. And there's no point in this class where you'll actually do it, but it's a nice thing to do if you want to go an extra bit. OK, our cool. Um, we have another puzzle now. So go back to the same group you were in. All right, here's what's going on. Here's a mystery method. And we want you guys to explain what the mystery method is. We were initially going to leave this as an open poll, but uh, here, here are some options that should hopefully make it easier. Um, so I'll just point out that there's a public mystery method, and then it's calling this private mystery method with a mysterious, no best argument. So the thing about it is, like, try to follow the recursion and try to see what it's doing, and try to see which of these functions it might touch. And one suggestion I have is if you have paper, maybe make up a small example. That's how I solve it. It's not lazy. But Arvin tried to do it in his head. <laughs>
we're still at noise right now. Oh, the right answer came from behind is winning handily now. Cool. All right, so some of you thought it's, it's the key passed as argument. Hmm, maybe. But there's some things that we can rule out relatively easily, I think. It's probably not minimum or maximum, because we're giving it a key and it's doing something with that key, right? If you were just asking for the minimum, you wouldn't even need to look at the input. You could just search through the tree for the minimum or maximum and return that. Yeah, it could be a trick question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but let's, let's look at this visually and try to see what it's doing. So let's focus on these two. Maybe it's ceiling or floor because the others are looking kind of unlikely. Um, so let's try and see if we can figure out which one of those it might be. So here's what's going on. Here's, here's the code over there again. And here's the comparison function. And here's how it's going to go through the tree. Um, so was M given his argument? Yeah, M was given his argument. Yeah, focus on M over there. So M is being compared to E, and it's greater than zero, and it's going to go to the right. And in purple, we're going to track the value of the best argument. Yeah, and initially it was null because that's we initially call this function with a null argument for best, and it's still going to be null over here. When it's going to get interesting is when the comparison function returns less than zero. Now your value for best is going to be S. Why? Because it's the line over here. Does this make sense? Right? So now we're, we're in this path. So best is S now. And which side of the tree are we going to go now? We're comparing M to L. So which side of the tree is that going to be? Right. We're going to go to the right. And we're going to retain S as the value of best. Why? Because we're over here now. And so we keep going. Right, all the way. And what happens here? Here, um, m was passed, and now we didn't find m, so we got x equals null, and so we're going to return best. And what is the value of best at this point? Right, the value of uh, best is going to be m. So what happens here? So m, this is the point of the tree where you would put m if you got it right for insertion. And we're returning the value that's immediately above that. Does that make sense? So what this code is doing is it's trying to search for the given key in the tree. And if it did find that key, it would return that same key. How do you know that? Which line in the code tells you that if it did find the key, it would return it? 
Exactly, yes, that's the L for turn X. So here, what we're visualizing is the other case where it didn't find it. And in that case, what it returned is the minimum value that was found in the tree, but that which is still bigger than M. And so what function does that correspond to? Ceiling, exactly. So ceiling is the right answer. Do we have one more visualization? Um, a little bit, yeah. So then at that point, the end just walks back up the tree. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay, so the end goes back up. And I think that, honestly, the way I solved this problem was I just made one up and then did it, and then kind of inductively decided that I was correct. And that's a pretty reasonable uh, approach, honestly, with these kind of problems. Okay. Um, if you're curious, I'll just mention this briefly. Yeah. So um, the iterative code, when you guys try and write code for a BSD, uh, for doing things with BSDs, it'll probably look more like this iterative code in general. The only thing I want to, you can try looking this on your own time, but in case you're curious in English, what an iterative as opposed to recursive implementation look like, um, here it is. So let's see oh, 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 yeah. one other point sorry, yeah. that I want to make about iterative. Um, remember I said about recursive earlier is that you always have the structure where something goes down the tree and it has to come back up the tree. In iterative, you want to stare at it later. That doesn't happen. You keep searching down the tree and when you get to the bottom, you just kind of directly jump up and return the answer. So that's one cool advantage of iterative. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the delete process. It's a little tricky. Um, so I'm going to give the, the conceptual picture again in a slightly different way. Um, and the code will be for you guys to ruminate on later. OK, so when you want to delete something out of a tree, and search that's no big deal. Find where it's going to go, put it in, we're good. If you want to delete something, we have three cases. And two of them are very easy. So here's the first one. If we want to delete something with no child, what do we need to do? Set what link in the node? Which, which link do we want to set to null? Yeah, eyes child, this bright red one. So indeed, there we go. And now he's spinning free in the universe and garbage can he can be collected. Um, so when you write the recursive call for delete, you'll find that the code has that same feeling for passing up a parent pointer. And again, this is a little bit too much for me to really digest right now, but I'm putting it on the slide because it's important. Um, so let's continue on with the conceptual process of deletion. So suppose we're deleting R. How many children does R have? One. And so what do we need to do? We need to, so we crawl through these links, which link needs to be fixed? I done right. And indeed, that's what happens. So all we do is we reset that pointer, and R now is free to be garbage collected. So that's the one child delete, also pretty easy. Now, in the two child delete, things are a little trickier. Um, in this case, um, if we want to delete, say, L, we have two children. So we can't just pull one of these guys up because they um, they may have their own children, so there's, there's going to be a, a problem where there's not enough room to accommodate all the links that need to be there. So in this particular case, um, so what we want to do is there's two natural choices of which node in the tree to promote into L's place. They are the successor and the predecessor, in this case, K and N. Why are these safe choices? Why is the successor okay to move there? <laughs> Yeah, so he's, uh, if he, is, he is bigger than L, but he's smaller than everything else in, his, in this tree, this little subtree. So it's okay to bring him up there because it, it's going to follow the BST rules. So we find the successor, and what's the convention in 226? Successor. So that's just an arbitrary choice. So in this case, we want to actually fix everything. So we've chosen him as our successor, and then easy, there we go, done. Okay, so what the hell do we just do? Um, so the things that we did is there are four pointers that must change, right? And getting this right in code is a little tricky, but conceptually, this is what you must know. These are important things. There's four things you have to update. The parent of the deleted node needs to know that my child is no longer L, but is now M. Uh, we have to notify the parent of the successor, this P, we have to let him know um, that his job has changed. Um, so the parent of the successor, he has to get modified. And then likewise, we need the successor to have new children. So those are the four pointers in red. Um, I think this is a little confusing now. Why is that one red? Uh, this redness is not quite right. So ignore this redness, sorry. But this is an important one. These are, where the, four, these are the four pointers that change. Um, and if you'll notice, L, like a phantom, still maintains connections to his children, a ghostly father. But because nobody points at him, garbage can still collect him. Um, okay, so that's the deletion process. There are four pointers that must change. 
feel free to look at the code, but it's not super vital um, at this point. But that's the thing you should know. Okay. Um, so the problem with this deletion process is it's not symmetric, as you may recall from Bob talking. Um, as we delete, and we're always picking the successor, and I'm going to jump forward a little bit here, it's only natural that we keep promoting in this asymmetric way, but you'll end up having a tree that dangles weirdly to one side. So that's a problem. And you can prove, and it's actually quite difficult um, to prove, that overall your total size will be the square root n, or your, your height. Um, and so you might, what's one way you might try and address this? Yeah, maybe switch off successor and predecessor, but through some proof that is apparently fairly nightmarish according to a supposed quote by Donald Knuth, um, it's very, it still maintains that square root n, even if you do the switch off. And there's this long standing open problem. What's a nice simple way of doing this with simple VSDs? Um, we will have a not quite simple solution, but still fully conceptually doable in the next lecture. We'll handle this. Okay, so just to summarize where we were, we told you why simple tables are amazing and how they solve all the world's problems and everybody's happy. And here's how various implementations are doing. So with the BSD, we have this nice property that we, on average, do very quickly logarithmic, but delete is ugly. And that will be the, next, the point of the next lecture. So that's what we want to try and do. Okay, so we're going to skip, I guess we want to just go straight to interview, or do one more? Let's, let's do that social network thing. Okay, that's kind of fun. all right, sounds good. So first thing I want to do is this is a design problem. So you guys need to think about Erweiterten Netzwerk, right? That's a German company. Minimalist. Yeah, they're minimalist. You know how Germans are. And there's two buttons on their website when you log in. You can either click the Neu button with the flat hand. No, relax. And what happens is, if you're logged in and I type in, say, Maya, and click Neu, we are now friends. The other thing I can do is I can pick another person, say Marvin, and I can press the Erweiterten Netzwerk button. And it will tell me whether or not there is some chain of friends between the two of us. So what I want you guys to do is pick at least one API that they'll want to use to implement this process. There may be more than one answer. So think about what Erweiterten Netzwerk should be doing. So in group, uh, actually, what you should do, I would say, you can do it in groups if you want, or just send it solo. what it knows what to do with, right? It just works on an array of consecutive, uh, or the indexes are consecutive integers, and so to go from usernames uh, to those indexes, that's kind of why a symbol table is essential. Um, all right, let's think about this. You've got n users, m operations. We're not saying if m is bigger than m or the other way around, it can be anything, right? So what is the worst case running time? Think about it for a minute.
So for either one of these operations, what's the first step that happens? What is the first data structure that we use? Symbol table, right. And uh, what is the complexity of a symbol table operation? Right, log in. So M doesn't matter here. For the symbol table operation, it's log in. And then next, uh, for, for this operation, what we would do with the, with the unique line? What is the query that we would run? Right, a connected query. And what is its complexity? Log in. Other answers? Mm. So, so over here, if there are M operations, what is the size of the um, size of the components that we have? Okay, for for the efficient union find, what was the what was the complexity of uh, of connected queries? Okay, do you guys remember a star somewhere? Log star. Does anyone recall what function log star is? Right, it's an extremely slowly, slowly growing function. By the way, there's another function that's even more badass than that. It's called Ackerman's function. Uh, Google that if you're interested. Like when I saw the Ackerman function, I was kind of scared. That's how, that's how weird that function. Is. That's how the log tables ended up on its walls. <laughs> <laughs> I do a few. Ackerman is probably the weirdest function I've seen in my life. But anyway, the operations for union find are only, or at least the connected query, are only going to be log star in which is less than login, but it doesn't matter because uh, for the symbol table we have login, which is bigger than that anyway, right? So we have login for a single operation, and we have m operations, so it's pretty much going to be m times login. Let's do, let's do another little one of these. Um, we should put a pass on this one and move on to the last thing, right? I kind of wanted to do this okay. pass on the last one. Okay. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> he was so excited about the last one last time. Uh, sorry. All right. Um, okay. Let's think about this. This is about amortized complexity. I know that a lot of you guys had questions about amortized complexity and how it's different from average case. This is a good way to work through all that. So what you have is a simple table, or really any data structure, whose, um, let's define the amortized complexity as four log n for n operations. But what does that exactly mean? What are we defining here? Here are three possible definitions. One is starting from an empty data structure, that's the key phrase, a sequence of n inserts and searches, uses n log n. Or, it could be any sequence of n inserts and searches, no need to start with an empty data structure. Or, we're starting from an empty data structure, the expected number is 4 log n, there's a small probability that it could take like 5 log n or whatever. So think about this, and think about which, which one or more of these are the right definition for amortized complexity. A bunch of you think the answer is none. I'm curious about that. Why might it be none of these? What else would it be? We're just making up random answers, or do you have a reason why it's none? I want to hear it. All right. Um, some people thought the answer is one and three. Can someone justify three? I would it be three. No. 
What's a, what's a key difference between amortized and average case? So in average case complexity, we care about randomness, and we care about most of the time it'll do something. In amortized, there's no room for any such argument. This has to happen every time. Right? So three is kind of ruled out. What about two? Um, all right, let me, let, me, um, let, let me sort of turn that on its head. Let's say two is the definition. Can you think of an example of inputs where that will horribly break? What might be a value of n for which things will really go wrong if we have two as our answer? Let's say n equals one. Think of a situation where n equals one, and then this is, and then this definition goes badly wrong. And say the resizing array. What's that? Log one is zero. Okay. Um, fine. N, n equals two. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. That's so there are two operations you can do in a resizing array. So n equals two, where that definition does not apply. So you're doing a sequence of operations. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, this definition is too strict because it says any sequence of um, insert and switch operations, it doesn't tell you when that sequence starts. So if you start counting right before a resize operation is about to happen, then that, you know, that definition will still say it only has to use 4 times 2 times log 2 compares, which is equal to what? 8, exactly. So even if a resize is about to happen, it doesn't care what the existing size of the array is. That's the key thing to keep in mind. This n here, it has nothing to do with the size of the array. It's just the number of insert and, and search operations. So that's why definition number two breaks. If a resize is about to happen, then that won't hold true. So one is actually uh, the only right definition. And that one is, because yeah, that's the definition. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. Bob said that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, though. It's useful. All right, so anyway, so that's what we have today. There's one, actually, we have, we'll, we'll move our interview question to the next lecture. Right? Yeah. So every, every class, we're going to move the interview question to the very end of the next lecture, all right? And then maybe at the end, we'll see you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. This is not happening today. All right, thanks, everybody. That was fun. And we'll post the answers to these things on the slides and the website. Your laptop here? I do. Do you want to show me? Um, yeah, you can do that right